looking to connect a region of over 600 million bridges between our lands. Hello, I'm Alma Angeles. Welcome to ASEAN in Focus. We're coming to you live from Manila in Vietnam. Hello, Eliana. Hello, I'm Eliana Faith Sebastian from ABC Vietnam Bureau, bringing you the news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. The, the Philippines joined other nations in calling for a halt to the ongoing violence in Ukraine. Vietnam evacuated some 460 Vietnamese citizens from Ukraine to neighboring countries, the Vietnamese Foreign Ministry said Wednesday. The Department of Education, or DepEd, has called for a more relaxed protocols for the conduct of in-person classes following the de-escalation of various areas to alert level one in the country. The Philippines joined other nations in calling for a halt to the ongoing violence in Ukraine. Cabinet Secretary Carlo Nograles, also the acting presidential spokesperson, said President Duterte gave assurances that mitigating measures and contingency plans will also be put in place as part of the government's proactive response to the Russia-Ukraine war. Take a look. The palace joins the country and the entire world in praying for an early and peaceful resolution to the conflict in Ukraine. We reiterate the position of the Philippines that war benefits no one and that it exacts a tragic bloody toll on the lives of innocent men, women, and children in the areas of conflict. The conflict in Ukraine has economic, trade, and human resource implications for our country and for our people. As we monitor the current situation, every Filipino has the right to know what the government is doing to prepare for any eventuality. President Rodrigo Roa Duterte has given assurances that mitigating measures and contingency plans will be in place as part of the government's proactive response to the conflict in Ukraine. For this reason, the President convened yesterday, March 1, 2022. Several members of his cabinet, along with top officials of the armed forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police and other high-ranking officials to discuss possible scenarios should the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict continue and escalate. In this regard, the President has approved the recommendations of his economic team to strengthen our domestic economy, stabilize food prices, provide social protection, and explore diplomatic channels to help resolve the conflict. As to food stability, the Chief Executive approved the recommendations of the Department of Agriculture to boost local food production. Kasama na rito ang pagpapataas ng produksyon ng pagkain sa pamamagitan ng pagpapatupad ng Plant, Plant, Plant Part 2. Pagpapataas ng rice buffer stock na hindi bababa sa tatlumpung araw. Pamamahagi ng tulong pinansyal sa ating mga nagsasaka ng palay at pagtugon sa tumataas na presyo ng abono o pataba, tulad ng pagbibigay ng fertilizer subsidy at market access through bilateral discussions sa fertilizer producing countries. Inaprubahan din ng Pangulo ang rekomendasyon ng Department of Agriculture sa pamamahagi ng fuel discount vouchers sa mga magsasaka at mga mangingisda bilang tugon sa tumataas na presyo ng langis.
The palace also called on Congress to review the oil deregulation law, particularly provisions on unbundling the price and the inclusion of the minimum inventory requirements in the law, as well as giving the government intervention powers, authority to intervene when there is a spike and or prolonged increase of prices of oil products as part of the government's medium-term measures. Again, let's listen in. On the supply of oil, the President approved the recommendations of the Department of Energy to implement the 2.5 billion Pantawid Pasada and the 500 million fuel discount program for farmers and fisherfolk. The DOE will continue to monitor the sufficiency in supply and quality and will make sure there will be no short selling. For the medium term, we call on Congress to review the oil deregulation law, particularly provisions on unbundling the price and the inclusion of the minimum inventory requirements in the law, as well as giving the government intervention powers or authority to intervene when there is a spike and or prolonged increase of prices of oil products. Also, part of our medium-term measures are building of the strategic petroleum reserve infrastructure, ensuring minimum inventory requirements, and advocating for energy conservation and efficiency. The President further approved the recommendations of the Department of Trade and Industry to accelerate renewable energy adoption support investments in utility-scale battery storage to maximize utilization of renewable energy sources, support investments in modern storage facilities for oil and grains to increase within the border holding capacity and empower the private sector to help in strategic stockpiling. Meanwhile, the AFP and the PNP gave assurances that our troops and our military and police assets stand ready and that they have respective contingencies prepared for any developments. In conclusion, we appeal for an immediate end to the unnecessary loss of life and call on the states involved to forge an accord that can help prevent a conflagration that could engulf a world still struggling to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. The course of history and the fate of our world will be shaped by the decisions that will be made by its leaders. We are one in prayer, together with all peace-loving citizens, that they be guided by wisdom and a genuine desire to save lives, establish harmony among neighboring nations, and forge a just and lasting peace for humanity. Meanwhile, the Department of Energy Secretary Alfonso Cusi assured the public on the sufficiency of the country's oil supply amid the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Kusi, however, cautioned against the inevitability of domestic price spikes reflecting upward global market movements. Take a look. Uh, it opens, uh, Russia Ukraine uh, conflict. This added uh, problems you know, to the increasing uh, price already in the world market. At saka, ngayon nga po, it's hitting uh, near $100 uh, per uh, barrel. So, uh, yan po ang ating binabantay ang mabuti ngayon and uh, sabi nga po ninyo, yung tungkol sa excise tax, no po, uh, ang naging position po natin yan as early as last year, no po, uh, sinasabi nga po natin na uh, to give us the uh, power to uh, suspend excise tax uh, when uh, an abnormal situation is happening. At saka ngayon, ngayon po, eh, humingi po kami ng uh, authority na yun. But unfortunately, we need to amend uh, 
uh, law no, for us to to be able to do that. The Congress have already conduct, passed and discussed that and that uh, na pending lang po sa Senado. So ayun po ang sitwasyon uh, as far as uh, what is happening now. Um, wala naman po kakulangan ng supply dito sa ating bansa. Ang panawagan lang po natin ay tayo po ay to conserve no the use or uh, maging marunong po tayo sa paggamit ng uh, at ng petrolyo na hindi lang ng petrolyo pati na po ng elektrisidad at uh, kahit sa wala pa pong kakulangan ang magiging mangyayari lang po dito uh, yung pong taas pagtaas ng presyo and uh, pagka umabot po ito ng uh, dati natin in 2014 i think uh, ang presyo po ay sumabot ng mga 100 uh, 110 110 dollars plus no po and uh, the looks of it uh, kung magiging prolong po yung uh, uh, gera sa uh, between Russia and Ukraine uh, talaga pong tataas pa po ang uh, po ng petrolyo Secretary Kuzi also said that the OE has been pursuing various measures to address the soaring prices of oil products. For a short-term solution, he said that the OE has been in constant coordination with oil companies for promotional programs that extend fuel discounts to the public transport sector. On the seventh day of fighting in Ukraine, Russia claims control of the southern port city of Kherson. Street battles are raging in Ukraine's second biggest city, Kharkiv, and Kiev is bracing for a feared Russian assault. Take a look. Нічого не знають про нашу столицю, про нашу історію, але у них є наказ стерти нашу історію, стерти нашу країну, стерти нас усіх. Захистити нас, захистити наших хлопців, для того, щоб ми могли спокійно спати тут, для того, щоб, щоб чим поскорше зупинити цю навалу. Краще так, ніж так, як вчора ми мусили сідти на сучу два кладара. sitting with my daughter on this room but as you can see in this moment it is not home not room it is 
may, maybe it is hell. I hope that in this moment my wife in a heaven and everything was perfect in his her life. States raised fears Wednesday that civilians are being targeted by Russia in Ukraine, warning that Moscow is moving cluster munitions and other lethal weaponry into the country in a potentially dangerous new phase of the conflict. One week after Russian President Vladimir Putin invaded his Eastern European neighbor, top U.S. diplomat Antony Blinken said the human costs are already staggering. Already the human costs of the Kremlin's unwarranted, unprovoked, and unjustified war on Ukraine are staggering. Hundreds if not thousands of civilians have been killed and wounded. There are now more than 174,000 refugees who've sought safety in nearby countries. Millions of Ukrainians still in Ukraine uh, are sheltering wherever they can. The Secretary of State spoke after a warning earlier Wednesday by U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, that Russia was moving exceptionally lethal weaponry into Ukraine. That includes cluster munitions and vacuum bombs, which she told the General Assembly are banned under international law and have no place on the battlefield. President Putin invaded Ukraine on February 24, igniting a global outcry and fierce resistance by Ukrainians. Hundreds of civilians have been killed and hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians have fled since the invasion began, while the West has imposed sanctions to cripple Russia's economy. Putin has also ordered his nuclear forces be mobilized in a move that sparked immediate condemnation. Putin has also ordered his nuclear forces be mobilized in a move that sparked immediate condemnation. Blinken slammed the Russian leader's nuclear rhetoric as the height of irresponsibility Wednesday, but said Washington was ready to support any diplomatic efforts to reach a ceasefire and the withdrawal of Moscow's troops. provocative rhetoric about uh, nuclear weapons is the height of your responsibility. Um, it's dangerous. It adds to the risk of miscalculation. It needs to be avoided. But if Russia pulls back and pursues diplomacy, we stand ready to do the same thing. Meanwhile, our intensive diplomacy with allies and partners continues. I've been in virtually daily contact with my, my friend and counterpart, Ukraine's Foreign Minister Kaleva. And I've made clear that we'll support any diplomatic efforts by the Ukrainian government to reach a ceasefire and withdrawal of Russian forces. The UN General Assembly adopted a resolution on Wednesday deploring in the strongest terms the aggression by the Russian Federation against Ukraine in violation of the UN Charter and demanding that Russia immediately cease its use of force against Eastern European country. And that the result of the vote is as for The result of the vote is as follows. In favor, 141. Against, 5. Abstentions, 35. Draft resolution A-ES-11-L1 is adopted. The message of the General Assembly is loud and clear. End hostilities in Ukraine now. Silence the guns now. Open the door to dialogue and diplomacy now. 
the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine must be respected in line with the UN Charter. We don't have a moment to lose. The brutal effects of the conflict are plain to see. But as bad as the situation is for the people in Ukraine right now, it threatens to get much, much worse. The ticking clock is a time bomb. I'm also deeply concerned with its potential consequences for regional and global peace and security and the world struggling to recover from COVID. Today's resolution reflects a central truth. The world wants an end to the tremendous human suffering in Ukraine. Today, the world has spoken with a clear, united voice. Together, the vast majority of the world has condemned Russia's unprovoked, unjustified, unconscionable war. We have deplored Belarus for allowing its territory to be used to facilitate this aggression. We have affirmed Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. We have demonstrated that Russia is isolated and alone. And that's the cost, that the cost will keep rising until Russia relents. We have affirmed the UN Charter, pledged to address the horrific human rights and humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, and stood together in the battle for the soul of the world. The message in this resolution is very, very clear, and the voting pattern, pattern is very, very clear. I, uh, Russia stands isolated. Russia has been asked by the world to pull back, stop the aggression, and seek diplomacy instead of war. It's a defining day, as I said in my statement. I'm happy to report, or rather to confirm what you saw with your own eyes. The United Nations is still alive and uh, going through the process of catharsis. I believe in the United Nations. Now people of Ukraine have more reasons to believe in the United Nations. In spite of the horrific actions by the criminal regime of Putin, we still believe that there are citizens of Russia who maintain their dignity. So when you, you tell me that Russia voted against, it's Putin's regime, criminals from Russia who voted against, it is regime of Belarus who voted against, because there are wonderful Belarusians, Belarusian people who also fight for their freedom. China was among the 35 countries which abstained, while just five, Eritrea, North Korea, Syria, Belarus, and of course Russia, voted against it. Japan and New Zealand led condemnation from Asia, but the continent's giants, China, India, and Pakistan, all abstained. During the debate, Beijing had stressed the world had nothing to gain from a new Cold War. On the meeting sidelines, Washington has taken aim at Russians working at the United Nations, leveling accusations of espionage and demanding expulsions. Now to Vietnam, where they evacuated some 460 Vietnamese citizens from Ukraine to neighboring countries, the Vietnamese Foreign Ministry said Wednesday. Right 140 citizens moved to Poland and are currently in Warsaw, 70 to Romania and about 30 to Hungary. About 220 citizens went to Moldova and will then depart for Romania. There are about 7,000 Vietnamese people in Ukraine, said Foreign Ministry spokesperson of the Foreign Ministry, Lethi Thu Hang, on March 1. Last week, Prime Minister Pham Minh Chin signed a public telegram ordering relevant ministries and agencies to ensure the highest safety and security for lives, property, as well as legitimate interests of Vietnamese citizens and entities in Ukraine. Pham ordered the foreign ministry to draw a plan to provide security and safety and evacuate Vietnamese citizens and members of diplomatic missions if necessary and provide them with food and other necessities. 
still in Vietnam, it had been uh, extremely uh, concerned over the ongoing armed conflict in Ukraine, according to a sovereign member state of the United Nations. Is Ambassador Dan Wong Yang, head of the de permanent, permanent delegation of Vietnam to the UN, made the above statement at the UN General Assembly's recent emergency special session on Ukraine. Dang said Vietnam and other ASEAN member states issued a statement on this matter on February 26, emphasizing that it's imperative now to exercise utmost restraint and immediately cease the use of force to avoid further casualties and losses, especially those of civilians. We call on concerned parties to de-escalate tension, resume dialogue and negotiation through all channels with a view to achieving long-term solutions that take into consideration the interests and concerns of all parties in accordance with international law in particular the respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of states stated dang the ambassador went on to say that such a solution will put an end to the ongoing suffering and make major contribution contribution to peace security and development in europe and the world at large and the news continues here on ASEAN in Focus. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Mr. Bawal, may ibis ko. What's on? <laughs> it's a prank. Okay lang manakot. <laughs> Pero kung mananakot ka para sa boto, bawal yan! Ayon sa Omnibus Election Code, threats, intimidation, terrorism, use of fraudulent device or other forms of coercion is an election offense. Sino ka usap mo? Baka alis na nga sa iba na lang mananakot. <coughs> Mr. Pwede! Mr. Pwede! May malaking ibig sa likod mo! Nox! Babawi ka pa, di mo ako may isahan. Ako si Mr. Bawal na nagpapaalala sa inyo na ang pananakot para sa boto. Ah, ipis! Uy, bawal yan! Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang paghirap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka na mangamba. Sasamahan ka namin ito pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon. May lalabas natin ang aking talino 
at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, mga kasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa New Era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti at tagumpay. lamang ang maaring bumoto. Isang taon ang ibinibigay ng Commission on Elections para magparehistro ang mga Pilipinong boboto sa darating na eleksyon. Kailangan gawin ito para maiwasan ang tinatawag na flying voters. Teka, lahat ba kayo nagparehistro na? Opo, isang kami lahat. Bakit tahimik ka? Hindi ka nakapagrehistro, no? Nakakalimutan ko. Ay, hindi na pwedeng boboto. Pabuti pa, bumili ka na lang ng balot. Kung kami pa bumili ng balot, eh, pwede na kami bumoto. Hindi, pero mabubusog ka. <laughs> Para sa karagdagang kaalaman, makipag-ugnayan lang sa pinakamalapit na barangay o bisitahin ang Comelec website. In Vietnam, the health ministry announced the highest single-day figure ever of COVID-19. The details live from Alf, uh, Ralph Kailao, our EBC correspondent in Vietnam. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Alma. Good afternoon. Here's the latest news here in Vietnam. On Wednesday, the health ministry confirmed 110,280 new domestic COVID-19 patients in all 63 cities and provinces the largest single-day record ever. Northern Nam Namdien province topped the list with 24,042 new cases, including 20,866 recorded cases from the previous days added to the national database. Followed by Bakjang province with 15,232, including 12,691 added cases, and Hanoi with 15,114. In the last 24 hours, 114 COVID-19 patients were reportedly died, with 18 of them died in Hanoi. In the previous seven days, the average death toll in Vietnam was 97. Since the pandemic began last year, the death toll in Vietnam has risen to 40,452, accounting for 1.1% 1 .1 of all cases, more than 3.63 million cases have been recorded with the most recent wave which hit the country in late April, with 2.52 million of them recovered so far. So far, 78.9% of the population has received two doses of the vaccine. And that's the latest news here in Vietnam. Back to you, Alma. Thank you very much, Ralph. You take care, stay safe. That's uh, a lot, <laughs> 110,000. Stay safe, Ralph. Thank you for your report. Thank you, Alma. Stay, stay, stay safe also. Thank I you. am Ralph. We love reporting live from Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. We live in interesting times. In other news, a leading Myanmar actor, singer and model jailed for supporting pro-democracy protests has been pardoned and released according to his legal team on Wednesday. Pang Takon, 25, a star in both Myanmar and neighboring Thailand, had been active in the mass protests that rocked the country following last year's coup, leading rallies and advocating through his massive social media following. He was arrested in a dawn raid at his mother's home in Yangon in April and in December was jailed for three years with hard labor for spreading dissent against the military. On Wednesday, he was pardoned and released and had arrived home, according to his lawyer, without uh, saying this, without giving any details. In a statement, the junta confirmed his release, along with actors Lu Min, Piti Wu, and Yandra Kiao Zin, in order for them to participate in nation-building with their art. 
it did not give further details. In February last year, Pang Takon, who had more than a million followers on Facebook and Instagram, posted pictures of himself in a white tracksuit with a megaphone, hard hat, and a white fluffy dog strapped to his chest at a protest. The heartthrob is also famous in Thailand, where he has appeared in TV shows and commercials. Between 3.3 and 3.6 billion people globally are vulnerable to climate change, according to Deborah Roberts, co-chair of the IPCC or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 2, as a new report which insists on the need for adaptation as climate change impacts are already grave, wide-ranging, and in some cases, irreversible. Take a look. The number quoted in our report is between 3.3 and 3.6 billion people globally who are vulnerable to, to climate change. And the report clearly indicates that those who are vulnerable are vulnerable for a number of reasons, either because of their geographical location, for example, on small island uh, developing states challenged by sea level rise, or those for whom the basic uh, needs have not yet been met through the provision of, of basic services and because of abject poverty. Coastal cities are, are really highlighted in our report as a place where immediate action uh, needs to happen. And, and while national leaders might not take notice, certainly local leaders will. Um, it certainly points to the ecosystems too that, that need to be restored and, and protected. So it provides a clearer roadmap for action. And I believe that will empower people beyond uh, the normal cohort of, of leaders. So by uh, building coastal or emphasis strengthening coastal protection, you are doing adap adaptation. And you have choices. You can either build a seawall or you can use the um, uh, marine ecosystems, the mangroves, and uh, that, that are there to protect your coastline you, you, and the salt marshes. But what this also tells us is there are adaptation li limits. And these adaptation limits provide important important orientation uh, with respect uh, to action. They give you a stimulus to say we, we cannot let climate change move on like this and and uh, impact our life. And certainly while the war in Ukraine is, is concern, concerning to everyone in, in the uh, IPCC, there are regions outside of the uh, afflicted uh, conflict zone which are waiting for this report. So Africa, the Americas, uh, the small island states. Um, and so I think there is an audience still, uh, even in the current context for, for this report, just because of the severe challenges that those regions experience. Your question kind of suggests the illusion as if there is the option to ignore uh, this report or to ignore climate change. And this is not an option. I mean, climate change is there. It's affecting us. It's 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 haunting us. And, and there is the urgent need to do something about it. There is an ex existential threat. So ignoring is not at all an option. Philippine National Police Chief General Leonardo Carlos flew to Cambodia on Wednesday for the three-day 40th ASEAN National Police or ASEAN APOL conference. In the statement Thursday, the PNP Public Information Office said Carlos is heading an 11-member delegation to the annual conference among national police agencies of 10 ASEAN member countries hosted by the Cambodian National Police this year. During the conference, the ASEAN Chiefs of Police will discuss the current transnational crime concerns, including efforts aimed at strengthening international cooperation with their counterparts against transnational syndicates. The 40th ASEAN APOL is attended by the Chiefs of the PNP, CNP, Royal Brunei Police Force, Indonesian National Police, Lao Police, Lao People's Democratic Republic General Department of Police, Royal Malaysia Police, Myanmar Police Force, Singapore Police Force, Royal Thai Police, and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam Police. The Department of Education, or DepEd, has called for a more relaxed protocols for the conduct of in-person classes following the de-escalation of various areas to alert level one. 
DepEd Secretary Leonor Briones said they are also further studying the blended learning system to adapt to changing situations in the country. And I'm sure uh, Secretary Duque will not mind. Ang level 1 at level 2 halos pareho sila. Halos pareho. So yung protocols ng level 2 pareho din sa protocols ng level 1. Ang gusto lang namin uh, Mr. President na ngayong alert level 1 na na uh, kakalat na talaga ng gusto ang uh, face to face eh kung pwede na i-reduce na yung mga protocols kasi we have two pages of protocols na dapat susundin ng mga eskolahan. So pwede na sigurong uh, i-reduce yan. This Friday, mag-usap ang Department of Health at saka ang, ang uh, DepEd para pag-usapan kung alin ang mga protocols na pwedeng i-relax. Agreement pa rin yun dahil maliwanag yung instruction ninyo, Mr. President, na kailangan magkasundo ang Department of Health at saka ang Department of Education. So this Friday, mag-meet kami. So finally, ang sunod na tanong na pinasagot sa amin, kung ano ang implication nitong pag-improve uh, uh, natin sa alert level 1. So una, ang ating policy, ang approach kasi natin, Mr. President, ay blended learning na depende sa sitwasyon ng isang eskwelahan. Uh, mayroon ng uh, batas na uh, pinupropose sa Congress nagawing legal ang blended learning na make it a legal requirement na depende sa sitwasyon kung anong approach ang gagamitin. Kasi Mr. President, uh, importante, mahalaga yung face-to-face, -face, pero mahalaga din na matuto ang ating mga bata sa online at saka sa digital. Kasi paglabas nila sa mundo, pag-join nila sa business sector, maraming mga online activities, maraming technical ano, at hindi mo yan, uh, uh, kailangang uh, up-to-date din sila, handa din sila sa pagtatrabaho. So, ayun ang tingin namin na lalakas yung blended learning. The DKI Jakarta Statistics, or BPS, has said that the number of foreign tourists inflows in Jakarta since the beginning of 2022 has increased rapidly due to the reopening of international arrivals. Jakarta experienced a surge in the number of foreign tourists in January 2022, reaching 14,089 visits. Head of Jakarta Statistics Angoro Dwit Jayono said in an official statement received in Jakarta on Wednesday. The figure rose 1,028.9% compared to the same month in 2021 when the number of visits was recorded at just 1,248, he said. Despite the increase, the current number of foreign tourists is still 92% lower than before the pandemic, he said. In January 2019, foreign tourist visits to Jakarta were recorded at 175,159, he said. He explained that the soaring number of foreign tourist visits has shown that tourism is slowly improving amid the COVID-19 resurgence, he said. This is due to the government's efforts to open international arrivals while tightening the monitoring of foreign travelers and increasing vaccinations in the country, he said. The Department of Trade and Industry, or DTI, is now encouraging more on-site work and lessened work-from-home setup as the country now moves to the new normal. Speaking with President Duterte during the talk to the people Monday evening, DTI Secretary Ramon Lopez said urging employees to physically report in their workplaces will stimulate economic activities. Meanwhile, National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA, Secretary Carl Chua, said the government's progress in implementing the 10-point policy of the Economic Development Cluster, or EDC, that would bring back more employment opportunities. 
para lang sila ma hindi mawalan ng trabaho, sige pumasok ka kahit 3 days a week, imbis na 7 days a week. So, yung tao, uh, hindi nila tinanggal para may trabaho, kasi pag tinanggal, mas malaki ang tama. Eh. Pero inalaw po sila, of course, kasama sa policy nat natin in the adjustment, inalaw sila nung parang uh, temporary uh, yung adjustment dun sa work time, para lang may income yung trabaho, yung tao na yon kahit 3 days a week. Ngayon, lumalaki na yan. Pwedeng sabihin, o oh, wag ka na 3 days a week, mag-report ka na 5 days a week or 7 days a week. So that will mean, mas marami siyang pwedeng kitain ulit. Balik siya sa dating uh, sweldo niya nung, nung bago nag-pandemia. Okay. Uh, according to NEDA, uh, kinu-quote ko si NEDA po dito, si Lasek uh, Carl, uh, ang additional business, uh, ang GDP, contribution to GDP, is mga 9.4 billion pesos per week. I-explain po ni Secretary Carl mamaya yun. Uh, yung iuulat ko po ngayon ay yung beneficyo ng Alert Level 1. At ito ay nagpapakita na we are really on the road to recovery. But we need to accelerate and sustain para mabawi po natin ang mga nawala sa atin dahil sa pandemic. Simula po tayo sa recent economic developments. The Philippine economy grew by 5.6% in 2021. Ito ay mas mataas sa expectation kasi yung sinasabi ng mga analysts, 5 to 5.5%. Nanggaling po tayo sa mataas na growth bago yung pandemic at an average of uh, more than 6 to 7%. Pero bigla itong bumaba dahil sa pagpasok ng COVID-19 sa 2020, minus 9.6% yung nawala sa atin at uh, nakabawi po tayo ng 5.6%. At uh, naniniwala kami, kaya po natin umabot ng 7 to 9% this year kung magtutulungan po tayo. In terms of employment, ay palapit na tayo sa pre-pandemic level natin. Yung nakakulay na green, yan yung ating unemployment bago pumasok yung COVID-19, yung January 2020. Bigla itong sumipa to 17.6% yung nag-impose tayo ng strictest ECQ. Pero yung nag-relax na tayo at nag-manage tayo ng risk at nagbukas po tayo ng iba't ibang sektor ng ekonomiya, pababa ito ng pababa to 10% to 8.7% at yung latest ay 6.6%. Malapit na ito sa atin pre-pandemic na unemployment rate. Dubbed as the inevitable convergence of the physical and digital worlds, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, or 4IR, is reshaping economies and societies around the world. The opportunities arising from its evolution in ASEAN are limitless. Let's take a look. We have come to a point where communities are no longer just physical. The world is rapidly moving into the digital space in a phenomenon that is also called the fourth industrial revolution. By and large, the opportunities deriving from the fourth industrial revolution in ASEAN are limitless as its technologies allow people to stay connected, help the region's economy to recover, grow, and become more competitive and improve and empower ASEAN citizens' livelihood and lives. To stay ahead, ASEAN brings forward its consolidated strategy, which embraces a unified and cross-pillar approach to the fourth industrial revolution. In the area of technological governance and cybersecurity, we envision a digital ASEAN that is open, secure, transparent, and connected while respecting privacy and ethics in line with international practices. In the area of digital economy, what we are after is a digital ASEAN that harnesses technologies to build a resilient, inclusive, integrated, and globally competitive economy. Finally, in the area of digital transformation of society, what is envisioned is a digital ASEAN that embraces innovation in transforming society, contributing to social progress and sustainable development. Today, in ASEAN, we are proud to say that we are moving towards a digital community 
and are ready to make the most of what the fourth industrial revolution has to offer. Thank you, Eliana, for keeping me company today here on ASEAN in Focus. Stay safe over there. That's uh, high cases. You have high cases of uh, COVID-19 now. Yes, Alma. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much. And you please stay safe too. Thank you. And that's the latest news in the ASEAN region. Thank you for joining us here in ASEAN in Focus. I'm Eliana Faith Sebastian from EBC Vietnam Bureau. And believe in interesting times. And we'll see you back tomorrow. Same time, same place. You're on ASEAN in Focus. Stay in the news because we live in interesting times.